Hi everyone, Hak Sameach. Uh, welcome to another edition of Paleoettes. Now, before we start off, you know, we're all in the middle of, you know, Sukkot. We're in Kol Amaleta Sukkot. And um, I don't know about you, but I've heard from a few of my friends, um, and some of them, you know, Lo Elenu, before all the Yom Tif began of Rosh Hashanah, and I know for even myself, um, it's just been a crazy and horrendous time, I think, for a lot of people in Am Yisrael. And, you know, my husband, you know, we came out of Yom Kippur, and I want to say almost immediately after, like maybe a few days after, um, he was in a, in a car accident, Lo Elenu, like the day after we had heard that his grandmother had passed away. Um, so I know a lot of people, and I felt like for myself, I just felt like, everything was just that much harder. It almost seemed like all of a sudden, uh, it was like, you know, when you're, if, if anyone's had a baby, you know, when you're in that portion of the childbirth that comes to the crowning and, and it's the most excruciating part. And I almost feel like all of a sudden, that's what like life has become. Everything has become so hard. And now even the simplest of tasks, the simplest of, of my, of without a shem has just become so difficult. Um, so I thought, you know, the best way to keep uh, getting light is to do a mitzvah because we all know the reward for a mitzvah is a mitzvah. Um, and I find that this has been a tried and true um, way of just bringing down light. Um, so I thought, um, you know, how apropos, we're going to get into paleoettes, but that the topic today was construction. And as we all know, we're, we were all, you know, just constructing our own um, sukkahs. But, you know, the, the thing about construction anyone who's owned a home, purchased a home, had to remodel a home, or has been in any kind of real estate, you know that sometimes you can find yourself in a money pit. Um, so we're going to talk about that and what the sages have to say, because of course we know the sages have like advice on everything. They've really been there, done that, and there really is nothing new under the sun. So it states, our sages in Yevamot 63a said, whoever engages in construction will be impoverished. Has shalom. In all other areas of expenditure, a person knows to plan how much to spend and he examines his capital. If he has sufficient funds, he commences the project in such a fashion that will not go bankrupt. This is not true about construction. A person plans to spend 100 Zeus and it becomes an expenditure of 200 Zeus. Um, so this is true, right? We, we, we think we're going to get, you know, fixer upper. I plan to do this. I'll pay, put this much in the house. And once you start opening up the boards and breaking through the, the drywall, all of a sudden there's all these problems. So it says, once he begins, he cannot terminate the project. And as a result, he may become bankrupt. It is therefore proper for a man to think first, if he can spend twice as much as he originally estimated for a building project, let him engage in the construction. If not, then he should desist. And a person needs to see the house expense first. As the popular saying goes, the store builds the house, the house does not build the store. And it would seem that it is better for a person to buy a building that is already built, for it has a fixed value and can be bought cheaply without, without uh, too much effort. However, according to the words of the Holy Zohar in Parshat Zariah, uh, Da 50a, it explicitly is forbidden to buy an already existing building from, no from a non-Jew. And, and even to receive it as a gift. This is because when the Goyim builds his home, he invokes the name of his idolatry. And the evil spirit immediately descends upon the home and he never leaves. Anyone who lives there may be harmed. Uh, this is the secret behind the spiritual plague of leprosy. Um, and it says that it would appear in the house in order that they would demolish the home, its stones and wood. Uh, this is not applied to a home built by a Jew with righteousness. That is, that the money invested was earned with integrity. Uh, when laying that foundation, he will clarify his intentions that his actions are for the sake of Shemaim and set his prayer before Shem. Upon completion of the home, he will make a dedication through the study of Torah and prayer. I've already composed an order of Torah study and prayer in Beit Tefilati. Uh, through these means, uh, sanctity will settle there on whatever he spends. And he should uh, say that it is, it is for a uh, building, a home inhabited for the service of Hashem. The more he increases the mentioning of the divine name upon the building, the better. Now, so of course, there's that famous um, example where, you know, uh, when, when, they, when, when the Yidin went to settle into the homes that were left over by the Goyim, uh, they, they noticed this leprosy on the wall and they had to tear it down. Um, and they found these treasures within the wall. Um, but this, you know, believe it or not, there is a difference in, uh, you know, there's a difference between the home that's owned by a Yid and the Kedusha that comes out of it uh, than that that was um, 
owned even by, you know, a, a good natured uh, a goy, a good natured goy. There is something different. Um, and, you know, when we're going into this territory of entering into a house to dwell in there, um, you know, we know alone by the fact that when we're saying that we're, that we're protecting ourselves, our goose, because there are spiritual forces um, that come and, you know, how much more when they come when we're, we're most vulnerable. But these things happen um, quite often. In fact, even if you're going into a construction site, you know, a house that's being built and it stays kind of empty or a house that's been dormant for a while, the advice really is not to go in by yourself and not to go in. You know, you have to have a lot of noise because these spirits, they come in, they dwell into these empty spaces. Um, very interesting, uh, you know, very interesting to get into. Um, but, you know, of course, again, like everything else, it always seems like on the surface, what's what's so bad about it? It's a great house. If it's my budget, the guy wasn't a bad guy. Why can't I just buy the, ha the house? Um, but just like when you have to tear down the wall because there's leprosy on it and and just beneath the surface you find out what's really going on uh, it's the same thing here it's it's not advisable um and there could be a lot of trouble associated with it so it says a person should be very careful not to violate a prohibition that may have uh that that many have trampled on to allow a goy to do work on shabbat yamtiv or koamoed about this type of conduct the verse says in yermiah 22 13 Woe unto the builder of his home without righteousness. The halakha authorities have written in Orach Haim Siman 244.3 that it is not permissible to enter in such a house and that those who stand at the head have the responsibility to rectify this breach if they have the power to do so. How good would it be for Hashem has explained a person's means and he has an ample space that he should build a special room to isolate himself for the purpose of serving his creator. He should also build a house for hosting guests. He must be careful to place the proper mezuzah in every doorway. Um, and one who does these things is guaranteed the divine presence will rest upon his home, that Hashem will protect his home, uh, his coming and his going, and that he will uh, have peace in his tent. Therefore, it is better for a person to build his own home and not to buy an existing dwelling unless it happens that, um, that it was a Jew who was careful in all these matters in selling his house. So I have to tell you, this is, this is very true. Um, you know, I have always um, labored with the belief that the more you spend on the mezuzah and, you know, for my husband, you know, we, we went out, we got like the top of the line to fill in. You know, we really believe that we've invested um, in, you know, our day-to-day -day life, that this helps us. And in fact, um, if any of you followed, it's especially like some of the Adorn with Dignity, or even some of the earlier, I, I think I might have mentioned it, Paleoettes, when my son was away in boot camp, that I would place my hand on his mezuzah and pray for him. And for sure, when he came back, he came with these, these stories that you can tell that Hashem was clearly with him. And, you know, so these things pay off. Um, it's a, it's a mitzvah that earns every second, you know, a lot of people like to invest in even, you know, the, the hardware of a door or what kind of plumbing, you know, fixtures they're going to have. And believe it or not, a lot of people will say this is an area that, eh, so long as I have it up, I've met the minimum. Um, but there was this story that I heard once of a young couple who was trying to conceive. They were, had just been, um, they had just uh, been married and they were trying to conceive and I believe it had been like a year, two years or so and they were unsuccessful. And of course, you know, the advice was to go check the mezuzah um, and the portion where it says, and you shall um, bind them uh, as a sign upon your arm. Um, I think that, that, the tra that the way they wrote it was like, you shall bind up their children. And so sure enough, when they changed the mezuzah, they changed, you know, they, they, they changed the mazal and, and she became pregnant. So um, very interesting. I, I know a lot of people, you know, you can hear a lot of people who just don't um, really think that it matters. But I, I tell you that I've heard enough stories and I myself have lived through enough um, examples of my own life to see Hashem's hand in this great mitzvah. So it states, in any case, a person should not spend astronomically to build an enormous house a building of stone or decorate a plastered second story, etc. For everything is vanity and the frustration of the spirit. And see Kohelet 114, he says, We are visitors whose days are like fleeting shadow upon the earth. And Divrei Hayamim 
uh, 1, 29, 15, it says it's better that he should use those funds to build a permanent dwelling in Olamaba, for this is the true home. And the Talmud Yerushami in Shekelem Perak 5 relates the story of two sages who were wandering from place to place in one city. Uh, there were magnificent synagogues, and one said to the other, how much money did my forefather spend in this place to build such a magnificent synagogue? His friend responded, how many souls did your forefathers bury in this place? Were there no people to toil in the Torah? That is to say that it would have been better to build a modest synagogue uh, and with the rest of the money to support those who devote themselves to the study of Torah. If this was said, even in regard to the construction of a synagogue for which there is a mitzvah to build a beautiful, uh, a beautiful house for Hashem, what shall those who make extravagant expenditures on the building of fancy houses while at the same time the Torah scholars scavenge for bread um, answer on the day of judgment? So it's true. Um, when you really, when you really start to build a great foundation um, with your service to Hashem, you do start to realize not only you know where's your money going, um, you know, because it's always like it's in stages, right? We we stop buying after material things to start putting towards spiritual things, but then there becomes like this other phase where you start taking. Um, from the spiritual face to really invest in things that maximize, um, you know, to maximize a return. It's, it's really, it's like investing. It, it, you really have to be smart about it. You have to make sure you're giving to causes that will maximize uh, your return because you are getting paid for this for every, uh, for every good that comes out of this. Hashem pays you in Alam Abba. So you want to make sure, especially given the times that we're in with Mashiach just on the heels, if he doesn't arrive uh, by the time this year is over, uh, that we're, we're putting our money towards things that really will maximize, um, you know, every cent uh, that we give. And Harav Avadi Abartanur, now vote 510, explain that Am, um, Am Ha'aretz, uh, you know, people of the land, is called this name because he engaged in settling the land and the construction of the buildings. This is in contrast to Torah scholar who would leave the land desolate. Someone who possesses intelligence will not desire to waste his time and exhaust his strength and days to build edifices during his short and fleeting stay so that others will end up living in them, his friends or his enemies or his wife's husband, while he is brought to rest in an earthly grave. Whereas someone who poses wisdom will turn uh, to, uh, to build houses in the eternal world through his good actions and he will only build in this world that which is minimally necessary for the service of God. Um, and it finishes off and it says, especially in diaspora, if possible, one should rent a dwelling rather than build at all and not establish his home in a defiled land. This is an indicator of his daily belief in the redemption and his anticipation of salvation as we uh, wrote in this place. Um, so this is very, this is a pretty well-known concept. You know, a lot of people, a lot of Yidin, uh, when they're out in the diaspora, when, they're, when, when we're all in Hutzla Arts, um, you know, many of us have taken the position not to buy a home. Uh, you know, what would happen, you know, having come from a family uh, that, that had to kind of, you know, pick up and move overnight um, and, you know, and having known friends out of the Holocaust, this is, you know, we really understand this statement. Um, when it's time to go, it's time to go, right? And the last thing we need is to be tied down by all these things. Um, it is, it's a lot harder said than done because we're, we're, we're such a low level. And uh, unfortunately we have become a generation really fixated on things. Um, but this is one of the biggest reasons, you know, why you don't uh, buy the house. When she comes, you're, you're kind of, you know, not that you're kind of stuck. Hopefully you'll be the kind of person that takes up and goes no matter what. Um, but you know, Heaven forbid that you should find yourself wrestling with the decision, you know, I'll wait till I sell my house, then I can go. You know, we don't know what tomorrow brings. We don't even know if there'll be a tomorrow. Only Hashem knows what will be. Um, but, uh, you know, I pray that we would all have the zakus to not have to even make these decisions, that everything will be uh, laid out, the path will be clear before us, um, but, and hopefully will not be tied down by our material possession. It says, however, if Hashem grants his beneficial, I'm sorry, financial success, and has tremendous resources, it is good that he should invest in houses, property, stores, and according to God's blessing, in order to rent them out. By doing so, he fulfilled the dictum or sages in Baba Matsya 42a. A person must distribute his capital, one-third in real estate, one-third in business, and one-third in cash. A person is capable of having possessions and wealth in his home while maintaining his righteousness for eternity. For example, if he discounts the monthly rent of a poor person or a Torah scholar, 
Uh, it is a proper that a man rents his property to a God-fearing individual or to a scholar who will learn to perform good deeds in it, so that the divine presence will reside there and his inheritance will be everlasting according to the verse of Mishlei 12, 7. The house of the righteous will stand, needless to say, one who gives his house to a sinful man, and the knowledge of the opposing evil forces is the same. It is better to rent his house or to, or to store a simple, good, and upright person for even half the uh, a usual amount. His earnings will be better than monetary income, for he shall eat the fruits in this world, and the prince will remain for him in Alam Abba. Behold, his reward is his deed, and his deeds are with him. So I got to tell you, you know, it's funny, um, you know, we were looking once, uh, I think it's going to be almost two years ago, we were looking in Queens, and I remember the broker, he literally like outright told us like, don't mention your Froom, as if in looking at me, you couldn't tell I was Froom or my family, so <laughs> it was like, um, but they, the, 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 the owner really did not want to rent to a Froom people, don't ask me why, um, so this is that concept, you know, if he had rented to a from person, whether it was myself or someone else, every, you know, if there's a shear given in that house, if there's mitzvot given in that house, if Shabbat is being celebrated in that house, this is all also going to the owner um, who instead has, you know, if he's got a lot of capital, as the sages suggest, you know, instead of, you know, building this extravagant home for himself, buys property um, and, and really can help the community in this way. And it becomes a big mitzvah to him. Um, but, you know, for whatever reason, sometimes I think we have our priorities mixed up. Uh, and that's just part of living in this generation and the time we're in. Um, hence why it's so apropos that we're giving this particular shear during Sukkot, uh, which really comes to teach us that this is a temporary home. This is not our Ulam Abba, like, you know, building sandcastles in the sky. Like, it, we go on and we're looking to acquire and to, to gain. And, and for what? And then we go to where it really counts. It's literally that. It's a sandcastle in the sky. It all falls down. Um, you know, this is a great time just to kind of reconnect with what's important in our lives. And it's not chasing after the money or that big shot, um, you know, that big shot in our career just to try to take that chance. You know, I, I would challenge you to take a shot with a gem and really go for it. Um, and see where your life goes and you know don't even be discouraged you know a lot of people like like we were saying in the in, and I was saying in the intro where you know uh, we were going through Yon Kippur and all of a sudden everything blew up and um, you know I know a lot of people are going through that right now and I know that some people you know even myself at times I felt like to what end you know we're doing all this to what end um, but I want to encourage you because there was something I learned very early on and that's how do you know that your chuva has been accepted and usually, you know, because all of a sudden all this trouble happens. There was something very beautiful that was said about when we were redeemed out of its rhyme. Um, that, you know, we were destined to be there far longer than what we were going to be there. And when Moshe Rabbeinu came, you know, initially he came and things got worse. And so Moshe Rabbeinu goes back to Hashem and he says, what's going on? Like, you know, I was supposed to go there, supposed to get better, you know, let my people go. And we're all supposed to leave. And that didn't happen. And in, in fact... The things got worse for all of Am Israel, and they were, you know, they had even more harsh and strict labor on them. Um, so it's been brought down as an explanation that when you owe a debt, um, and the king is, you know, he's here, he's, uh, he's going to, you know, forgive the debt. You have a certain amount you have to pay. Um, so in other words, let's say, you know, you owe $100,000 to the king, and, uh, you know, you really, 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 you're in need of him to forgive the debt. So he says, I'll forgive uh, 500,000 of it. So I took away half. Um, but you've paid about 300,000. So now he's going to kind of speed up that payment. And that comes in the form of Yusurim to kind of, you know, the more Yusurim you get, you know, we all heard it. And, I, and I'm saying it, I'm with you guys, like easier said than done. When you're going through it, you're going through it. Um, but that acceleration of the payment, you know, perhaps this is all, you know, just the final push that we need that's going to bring our redemption um, and give us that even bigger Olam Abba. Um, so I'm with you all in all this. I pray that we all, you know, have a happy, healthy, and safe, safe hug. This is a time of our joy. And I know that a lot of things are going on. It doesn't seem like we have, it doesn't seem like we have anything to be happy about. But that's, that's the, really the secret of Sukkot, right? This is our time of our joy. If you can still laugh and dance, come Simchat Torah, aside from the fact that you really have no reason to dance, 
that's that's the secret that's when you got it to have that simcha when there is no reason to be simcha anyone can have simcha when everything is going great it's when things are all going down they seem to going down um but i promise you hashem's not left us he's with us and uh i hope to be together with all of you again soon if mashiach's not come visit at hashem